COVID Road Trip and RV Adventure by Linus Wilson. Copyright 2021. Ox River Publishing, all rights reserved. Ox River Publishing is a division of Vermilion Advisory Services, LLC. Narrated by Linus Wilson. Production copyright, Linus Wilson. Ox River Publishing, Vermilion Advisory Services, 2021. Chapter 1. A Reluctant RV Traveler. COVID-19 changed what I thought was possible. I could not envision a cessation of international commercial airline travel. It had never happened. I could not imagine United States governors closing businesses and schools by fiat. It was unconstitutional and contrary to the basic principles of little r Republican governments. It all happened. Never had the government society or the economy been sacrificed to the narrow worldview of epidemiologists or virologists. The views of selected lionized virologists and epidemiologists were allowed to dominate all aspects of people's lives. This is not to say that COVID-19 was not a deadly pandemic. It has killed over half a million Americans at the time of writing and was the second leading cause of death in the United States in 2020 after heart disease. Because it edged out cancer, COVID-19 was used to justify massive government power grab and economic shutdowns that disproportionately pushed women out of the workforce and stole a year of education and socialization from a substantial proportion of children and young adults. When I went on my road trip, there was no vaccine or proven treatment for COVID-19. I believe the approved COVID-19, the vaccines are a blessing of modern technology. I encourage all readers to get one, to hasten their return to normality as well to protect themselves and the lives of the people they care about. Despite my distaste for the anti-democratic policies brought on for COVID-19, I generally did practice social distancing, washed my hands frequently, or used hand sanitizer, and wore a mask when near people, as I would told to during the trip. There were other dictatorial edicts which violated the Constitution and were never endorsed by any state legislatures, that I might have ignored in my travels by RV in the summer of 2020. My daughter Sophie and I were confined to the house for months in the spring 2020. Even my wife Jana, a physician, started doing remote visits from home. I exercised and went to the grocery store. We ordered takeout from the local restaurants. Most people followed the stay-at-home orders for the first month or so. By the time my classes ended, most residents of our hometown seemed fed up with the governor's illegal orders and traffic jams resumed in Lafayette, Louisiana. I shared the wonderlust of my fellow residents of Louisiana. I was fed up with COVID-19 justified dictatorships cropping up in all 50 states and most foreign nations. I wanted to leave home. The least regulated form of travel was RV. I was forced to teach my courses remotely for the first time in spring 2020. My experience as a video creator on YouTube with millions of views meant that I knew how to create effective video lectures. One student described my video lecture series as seamless, and the comments for that term were glowing. Nevertheless, I spent four times more time teaching, and I believe remote learning is far inferior to in-person instruction. I have evidence from the fall 2020 term that academic dishonesty was on the rise among my college students. When my tests were moved to in-person in spring 2021, average test grades fell substantially from their lofty heights in the fully remote fall 2020 term. My daughter Sophie, who was in third grade, was forced into remote instruction. We hired a tutor because Sophie was not equipped prior to the pandemic to sort through emailed assignments and connect to Skype and Zoom. Most kids were not so lucky and fell way behind during the pandemic. When remote instruction ended, Sophie never missed a beat and did better than ever. Many primary students were not so lucky and 2020 to 2021 were lost years for many American school children. Thankfully, her school moved to full day, five day a week instruction in the 2020 to 2021 school year. Many American children were not so fortunate. I have been sailing around the world since 2006. 
15 during the months of May to August during my summer breaks. The beginning of that trip is in my book, Slow Boat to Cuba, and the outline of my part-time around the world plan is in how to sail around the world part-time. We went on our first international trip on the 31-foot on-deck island packet sailboat in 2015, detailed in slow boat to the Bahamas. I sailed the boat into Nomea, New Caledonia in June 2019. I hauled it out in a boatyard in the capital of the French Overseas Territory, which is 700 miles east of Australia, in July 2019. I last visited the boat on the hard in January 2020. Then while I was interviewing volunteer crew in March 2020, the world changed. The borders closed indefinitely. My flights for May 2020 were canceled. My boat and the round the world trip were inaccessible. All flights were shut down to New Caledonia and passenger boats were banned. This was a devastating blow to me. At the time of writing, the border of New Caledonia will not be reopened to tourism and commercial flights will not resume until October 31st, 2021. If I wanted to travel, USA only travel was my only option. Owning two large sailboats was not really considered. Boats are very needy and expensive. I was already exhausted from the maintenance from one sailboat. Also, boat travel, even within the USA, is much more regulated than by road. There are dozens, if not thousands, of roads you can choose in the USA on any given day. On a sailboat, you could reach one or two ports if you got up early. Ironically, the open water is much more confining than it looks. That is why circumnavigators often stop in almost the same ports. There just are few reasonable ports for a sailboat to go to. Janet and I decided to buy an RV. Chapter 2. Money can buy me an RV and a Jeep to pull it. We purchased a new Camp 320S on May 16, 2020 for about $20,000. This was after a couple of weeks of negotiations for the trailer and my search for the appropriate tow vehicle. I settled on a Jeep Wrangler Unlimited as its tow vehicle. The Wrangler Unlimited had a 3,500 pound towing capacity. The new camp Tab 320S weighed less than 2,000 pounds wet. I liked the Wrangler look. It had more internal storage and maneuverability than a truck. The new camp Tab 320S was a 15 foot long teardrop trailer that was 7 foot 9 inch tall, leaving 3 inches to spare when getting into the garage. I did not want to pay for storage. The New Camp Tab 320S had a shower, toilet, sink, AC, heat, hot water, and two propane burners. The only other camper that I found that fit our criteria was the small Scamp, but it was on back order until 2021. We certainly could have gotten a bigger trailer for the same price, but that was not what we wanted. I did not want to have to pay for storage for who knows how many years for the RV, and I did not see the trip as it's three months and done. Of course, heavier trailers also mean bigger gas bills too. I owned my Mini Cooper for 15 years and I plan to own the RV for several years. The 2020 Jeep Wrangler Unlimited search was complicated by my desire to get the base model Sport, which is a stick shift. A Wrangler Unlimited can cost two times more than the base manufacturer's suggested retail price if you get one with all the bells and whistles. The nearest one was in a small town in Texas. I picked it up a few days before the new Camp 320S. In retrospect, my local dealer could have probably arranged the transfer for the same price. Unfortunately, our salesmen, like other salesmen talk that I talked to subsequently, were not interested in selling the base model. The MSRP was about 30000 for the Jeep Wrangler Unlimited Sport, and I paid pretty close to that plus tax. I sold the 2005 Mini Cooper for $2,000. Soon after picking up the Jeep, I listed the Mini on Craigslist and it sold within a day. It looked great and had low miles and ran great. I spent a few days getting a hitch installed. You can't get a tow package on the base model and there were few stick shift Jeeps nationwide such that there were none set up for towing. A local dealership installed the hitch and electrical connections for the ball. We got an adjustable mount to better balance the trailer since we were not 100% sure of the height 
In the end, the new Camp 320S was about three inches lower than my hitch. The Jeep dealership could not install an internal control for the trailer brakes. They suggested getting a Kurt Echo, which is inserted between the seven pin electrical connection and is remote controlled through an app. I use my spare unlocked phone for the manual trailer braking, which I almost never use. The extra phone needed a visible mount. The sticker mounts came unstuck. I had an air vent mount that held better, but often fell to the passenger side floor. I'm currently using a 12 volt mount, but that is about as reliable as a vent mount. Any truck stop will give you about four different options. Jana, Sophie, and I all drove to Jacksonville, Florida on a long weekend to pick up the travel trailer. At the time, the elected Fort Florida dictator, Governor Ron DeSantis, was banning visitors from states and Louisiana residents had been targeted for bans more often than not. When we crossed the border, we were forced to get off. We needed to sign a statement on penalty of jail and fines that we would quarantine for 14 days. We refused to sign and said we would turn around. They said the only way to turn around was to go to the next exit. We went to the next exit and kept driving to Jacksonville. We picked up the trailer and stayed in an $88 per night RV resort nearby. The next day, we arrived in Lafayette, Louisiana. We struggled getting the RV up our sloped driveway. There was not enough room to back up the RV straight, and with our total lack of experience with backup cameras or trailers, it took hours. The trailer was too heavy in reverse and two-wheel drive on that slope, and the clutch smoked. I found that using four-wheel drive low was much more effective. On the next day, I took the Jeep into the dealership, and they said they could not find anything wrong. Almost a year later, I got a letter saying that my Jeep Wrangler Unlimited was to be recalled because clutches were bursting into flames. Unfortunately, Jeep had no fix for this recall, and you could not get it fixed. Thus, you could only stop driving it while waiting for Jeep to devise a solution. That was not helpful. Unfortunately, that did not pause my car payments or the need to drive. The smoking clutch has happened a few more times with lots of starts and stops with the trailer in reverse. I wanted to park overnight for free, which is often called boondocking, but worried about my electrical needs. I bought my third Honda 2000 watt generator. The other two quiet and portable generators were on my boat in New Caledonia. I wanted to mount it on the trailer in front of the propane and battery compartment. I found a four wheel wheeler basket that I bolted onto the trailer in the front just behind the jack. It worked perfectly and I had room for two two gallon gas cans. This added 70 pounds to the 200 pound tongue weight. Since the Jeep could handle 350 pound tongue weight, this posed no problem. Chapter three, camping in Louisiana. The first weekend back, Jan and Sophie and I took the travel trailer for a shakedown cruise to a state park close to New Orleans. Google Maps dropped us on the pothole ridden streets of the Big Easy on our way to the St. Bart Bernard State Park. We got there just in time to turn on the air conditioner and a, on full blast and join the Zoom wedding party for Jana's youngest sister, Diana. Diana had been quarantined for 14 days, so just her parents and her fiance. Mike's parents could attend in person. The ceremony was officiated by the groom's sister, who took a quickie course that was accepted by the state of Wisconsin. All the rest of the family, besides the maid of honor, honor Jana's sister, Christina, attended remotely. Life went on with the COVID restrictions, but it could have been better if Diana had an in-person wedding. We all were made to sacrifice in 2020. Nobody got sick, thankfully. We were overrun by bugs on the One Mile Nature Trail of the St. Bernard State Park. Getting close to the nature in Louisiana in May was painful. Prior to that weekend, I joined Harvest Host, which is a membership where you can park your RV at wineries, farms, museums, and other places of interest with a reservation. I had booked a couple of days in a winery in Louisiana and Texas for the next week. When we drove back to Lafayette, I used my Harvest Host membership to park the trailer overnight at Vermilionville Museum and Cultural Center in town to avoid pushing the trailer up my driveway. At the time, it made sense since I'd never tested reversing in four-wheel drive, and I did not know how well it would work. Further, I was still learning about 
backing a trailer, and our driveway was a hard test for a rookie. I drove back home for the final night before the big trip. I drove the nearly 200 miles to Landry Vineyard in northern Louisiana on my first leg of the big RV trip. My two-year-old toy poodle, Avery, was my only companion. He rode in the passenger seat. My RV trip was in part inspired by the nonfiction memoir, Travel with Charlie by John Steinbeck, the author of fiction classics of Mice and Men and the Grapes of Wrath. Steinbeck wrote of his RV trip with his dog, Charlie, in his truck bed camper. This was Avery's first big trip with me, but he had gone on all our car trips and most of our plane trips, too. Our previous toy poodle, the departed daily, joined me for many of my sailing trips before he died, including a cruise of the Gulf Coast of the Bahamas, a cruise of French Polynesia, and sailing from New Orleans through the Panama Canal to Ecuador. At one gas stop, I fail to walk Avery to the grass. Avery became very agitated in the Jeep, and I found the first turn off in 20 miles of narrow rural roads. He peed for like two minutes in the grass beside the road. Good dog. I jumped the gun on the turn for the vineyard and turned into some poor guy's driveway. With my inept backing skills, he suggested I just off-road in his yard. I still struggled backing up without jackknifing the trailer. I arrived at Landry Vineyards at 5 p.m. Their tasting room closed at 5.30 p.m. Uh, Mr. Landry drove me to the tasting room from the RV parking spot, and I bought a bottle of sweet wine. Unlike most wineries that I had stopped to since, Landry Vineyards had their own grapes surrounding the winery. They said it was all right to run my generator in something that is not unusual for Harvest Hosts. My RV was the only one at the winery when I visited. Our Tab 320S had 11 gallons of fresh water, 19 gallons of gray, and 8 gallons for black water. Gray water is the soapy water from showers and sinks, and black water is discharged from the toilet. After my first night, which showed I did ditches, dishes, it showed I had two-thirds of fresh water left, and gray was one-third full. I had a five-gallon collapsible water carriers in the Jeep that I used to fill the drinking water tank when not using city water. Chapter 4, Rookie Mistakes. Avery and I entered Texas. At one of the fuel stops, I saw pinkish-brown fluid dripping down under the hood onto the ground. I first hypothesized that it was transmission fluid. I drove to the nearest Jeep dealership. They looked and said it was coolant fluid. I had improperly secured the coolant cap and it bubbled out. Dirt from the ground or engine made the coolant fluid look brown. I bought more coolant there and refilled what I'd spilled out. I was checking all the levels after the smoking clutch problem and did not properly secure the coolant cap. Within 20 minutes, Avery and I were on our way. The Terra Winery was about 230 miles to the west in Texas. I missed the first turn off to the entrance of the winery, which was on a very steep hill. The rural road just went on and on. I tried to make a U-turn on the dirt connecting road, which also had a steep slope. I jackknifed the trailer and the clutch smoked in 2H, two-wheel drive, or the 4H four-wheel drive high. I tried to decouple the trailer, but the trailer hitch handle was too close to the Jeep Wrangler's spare tire on the rear to drop the jack. It was also impossible to remove the spare tire with the jack crank in that position. After two hours of struggle, I shifted with the with effort into 4L, four-wheel drive low. That was enough power to extract the Jeep and trailer heading in the wrong direction from the winery. Terra Winery called me to see why I was late, but never offered to help. When I called to tell them that I would not be coming, the lady was miffed. After that adventure, I had no appetite to try my luck at their steep driveway if I ever found a place to turn around. The ordeal taught me that there was very little room to put on our trailer wheel, and a gardening shovel would be handy to dig under the ground to slip on the jack wheel, which should be stowed while towing. Moreover, the jack crank is on the side of the tow vehicle, not the trailer. Thus, you have less room to crank the jack if 
its handle were on the trailer side, not the tow vehicle side. This makes it problematic to access the trunk while towing on with the Jeep Wrangler, whose trunk swings out like a passenger doors. In contrast, trunks on hatchbacks or sedans swing up. I wanted a flat RV park. I signed up for the RV membership program Passport America before departing. I found the log cabin RV park on Passport America's app, which charged $42 or $21 for Passport America members. Passport America gives half-off rates for select RV parks. These are usually not the nicest RV parks, but they are typically have full hookups, which are defined as city water, electricity, and sewer hookups. With our small tanks, I need to dump the gray and black tanks after four days anyways. The log cabin RV park proprietor got a bit upset when I asked about showers and she said they were shut down. I told her it was not a problem. I would take a shower in my RV. In the tab 320S, I had a sit down shower and I used as little water as possible to conserve water and not use a gray tank. At least they had pull-throughs. She gave me a good tip when observing my rookie form. Check this side-to-side -side level before unhitching. That way you don't have, that way you can place the leveling blocks before the unhitching process. Janet, with the guidance of her dad, Tom, who owns a travel trailer, wrote this unhitching, rehitching checklist. Hopefully it will illustrate why having a hitch can be so time consuming. Jana's rehitching checklist. Wheel on roll, camper to car. Raise tongue, place over ball. Lower tongue, over ball. Lock it. Remove wheel and stow. Chains on, safety release to carabiner. Umbilical cord to Kurt Echo to car, check brake lights, turn signal lights, look underneath, make sure nothing is dragging, drive a short distance, get out and look again and make sure nothing dragging. Jana assumed that we would wheel the tab to the car. While that is possible on level concrete pads, in most cases pads were not concrete but dirt or gravel, in which case rolling the trailer by hand would be almost impossible. I usually just use the backup camera on the Jeep to get the ball under the raised trailer tongue. The log camp at RV park had so many burrs. In a minute of walking around, Avery had 60 burrs or nettles in his fur. I spent an hour cutting them out with scissors. My next Texas winery was flat. I was uh, the first RV to stop in two days according to their sign-in book. Because the owner's daughter's living quarters were right over my parking space, I did not ask to use the generator after the tasting. Avery was very distressed by the winery's horse. Oreo, the white and brown spotted horse, might have been the first horse Avery ever saw. I came across the problem of it being hard to release the tongue of the trailer when unhitching. I learned that the best thing to do was to slightly move the Jeep forward or reverse more easily. Chapter 5, Into the Desert. Avery and I did another 200-ish mile day at the AOK RV Park in Amarillo, Texas. By the time you reach Amarillo, it feels like you have arrived in the desert, especially with its gale force winds blowing sand. Avery was treated to more large animals there. They had emu, donkeys, llamas, and longhorn cows. I was tempted to visit Palo Verde State Park, but decided against it. The dictator of Texas, their elected governor, Greg Abbott, banned Louisiana residents in recent weeks who did not quarantine for 14 days. I wanted no interaction with the state government that would confine its neighbors in violation of the Interstate Commerce Clause of the U.S. Constitution. The scrub desert scenery continued as I drove from Amarillo into New Mexico. Also, we started to gain elevation, and I found that I had to drive in third gear up the hills or the rig would lose speed. If I wanted to go 69 miles per hour uphill on the freeway, I needed to push the Jeep to 4,000 RPMs versus 25,000 RPMs that fourth gear could do on flatter ground at that speed. The altitude and heat caused the Jeep's tire pressure to rise. The cold pressure was supposed to be 36 pounds per square inch, PSI. 
I found that the tires after driving had 45 PSI in New Mexico. I took three to four PSI off the tire to compensate for the heat and altitude in both the Jeep Wrangler and the travel trailer. I had my first taste of cracker docking in Albuquerque, New Mexico. Cracker docking is camping in the parking lot of Cracker Barrel restaurants. New Mexico took the lockdown more seriously than Texas. Passport America was warning that many RV parks might be closed. I preferred to get free parking space after buying a good meal at Cracker Barrel. I think I paid $11 before tax for the entree. Like select Walmarts and Cabela's, Cracker Barrel was a national chain that welcomed RVers to stay overnight in their parking lot. Cracker Barrel had designated bus slash RV spots in the back of most restaurants. Cracker Barrels are much less busy than Walmart stores and rarer Cabela superstores. Moreover, with all restaurants doing takeout, it was even less busy than pre-pandemic days. I called ahead. The spaces did mostly fill up, although I was the first to arrive. Before 9 p.m., two conversion vans pulled up, as did two larger travel trailers. The downside of cracker docking is that folding chairs are frowned on and there's no water or electric hookups or even a dump station. Nevertheless, cracker docking is far preferable than sleeping in a noisy, stinky truck stop or rest area where grumpy teamsters are likely to scold RV travelers. Truckers must take mandatory Department of Transportation rest breaks and don't like the vacationer RVs taking their spaces in truck stops or even rest areas. I found it impossible to find a gas station bathroom in Albuquerque, New Mexico due to COVID-19 regulations. Really? Did the city government think people urinating and pooping in the streets was going to promote public health? I never tried it, but there wasn't any alternative for non-RVers who did not take their black water tank with them wherever they went. The ban on public restroom usage was covid idiocy at its worst. Carlsbad Cavern National Park was closed due to COVID-19 in May 2020, thus I drove by. Likewise, travel to the Four Corners was severely restricted due to a bad... coronavirus outbreak in the Navajo Nation. Avery and I just drove through New Mexico. Chapter 6, Petrified Forest. Jana raved about her childhood visit to the Petrified Forest National Park. The Petrified Forest has ancient wood that has been replaced by minerals over many thousands of years. I first visited by driving through it pulling off at exit 311 and drove through its painted desert. Avery and I hiked the first trail, but turned around early because of the heat. We stopped and tried small hikes until the Blue Mesa, but skipped the one-mile hike. From then on, we made brief stops in the petrified forest side of the park because it was getting late in the day. I had read that the petrified forest gift shop, a private outfit just outside the park, had free RV spots. It was closed. There were signs marking the RV spots. The signs were adamant there was to be no tent camping. Many of the spots had electrical hookups, but were not operating. The competitor to the Petrified Forest gift shop, the Crystal Forest gift shop, across the street was open. They said I could stay there for free without electricity or $12 per night with electricity. I wanted a hike without Avery, who struggled more with the hot hikes than I did. If I could leave him in the travel trailer with the air conditioning on, I could make some longer desert hikes. The spots were all back in. To my surprise, I succeeded in backing into a space after about 10 minutes using the Jeep's backup camera. The AT&T signal at the Crystal Forest gift shop was too poor to get email or open a web page. I would have to drive closer to the freeway for those luxuries. I did the hike from the petrified forest to the Blue Mesa in the National Park while Avery chilled out in the air-conditioned trailer. Avery saved all his pooping and peeing for when I returned for lunch. I did have a floor diaper pee pad like the one he uses at home, but he refused to use it in the way that he did at home. I had to put rocks around the pee pad floor diaper so it would not blow around in the AC ventilation. I found some boondocking spots on the Bureau of Land Management BLM 
land near Flagstaff, Arizona, where a better cellular signal was promised. BLM land typically allows dispersed camping, boondocking for up to 14 days. Avery and I took the 120-mile trip the next day. In Flagstaff, Avery and I prepared for our trip to the south rim of the Grand Canyon. We bought drinking water, which we put in the five-gallon collapsible jugs at Walmart for 29 cents per gallon. On average, I use about three to four gallons of water per day off the grid, and I ran the generator when I needed air conditioning or power for my computer. I found a Flagstaff groomer who would give Avery a trim. Poodles need their hair cut every month or two because they don't shed. After three days of boondocking at Flagstaff, we were ready for the luxury of full hookup spots inside the south rim of the Grand Canyons National Park, which I had reserved weeks before. Chapter 7, Grand Canyon Highs and Lows. Avery and I departed the Walnut Grove National Monument outside of Flagstaff, Arizona, to the south rim of the Grand Canyon on June 5, 2020. I booked six nights of full hookups inside the park at the Mather Campground. This was by far my best RV spot of the entire trip. To be minutes away from the hikes and activities allowed me to see so much more than I had had I stayed outside the park. Nevertheless, silly COVID regulations kept me from doing laundry there, and I had to spend half a day to find a laundromat at another RV park in Williams, Arizona, instead of doing my laundry on site. Also, Mather's showers were closed for the COVID-19 restrictions, forcing me to shower inside the trailer. The first day, Avery and I visited the South Rim Trail of Time. I was moved to tears when I first saw the canyon. In many ways, my principal goal of the trip was achieved. We scouted the start of the Bright Angel Trail, which I would attempt the next morning. The Bright Angel Trail is rated 15.6 miles from the South Rim to the Colorado River. My Garvin Global Positioning System GPS watch said I was t- it was 20 miles. I moved very slowly compared to almost every other hiker I saw. I especially moved slowly down climbing from the rim, but I also had to pause on the climb up. I would pause whenever my watch said my heart rate was over 150 beats per minute. I packed out about 3 liters of water and was able to refill at the 1.5 mile mark three mile mark and the Indian Garden. In addition to water, I packed a variety of calorific and salty snacks such as oatmeal, pies, nuts, corn nuts, and beef jerky. Without salty snacks, you risk neutropenia, a serious condition that prevents you from properly hydrating. Without calories such on such a long hike, you will bonk, as distance runners like to say. Bonking is tiring substantially due to lack of calorie intake in a multi-hour endurance challenge. I have both bonked and suffered neutropenia when I ran the Washington, D.C. Marine Corps and Philadelphia marathons, respectively. I started just after dawn, and it was just over 11 hours before I returned to the South Rim after touching the Colorado River. I started with many layers and took most of them off into my pack after the first hour. Towards the end of the day, I put some more layers on. The next day, I took care of my laundry crisis outside of the park, and Avery and I hiked the small hikes from the trail of time to the closed east entrance. The following day, I hiked the west side of the rim from the start of the Bright Angel Trail to the Hermit's Trailhead alone. Because the buses were not running due to COVID-19, I had to to do the round trip, doubling my official miles from 7.6 to 15.2 miles. Nevertheless, my watch showed the round trip to be about 20 miles. I alternated between sweating with my wool sweater or on, or having chilly arms with my polo shirt only on top. When I got back to the car, I drank a cold soda from the cooler and teeth-chattering chills set in. Running the Jeep heater on full blast helped cure this unnecessary bout of hypothermia. That was a lesson I would not soon forget. Steer clear of cold drinks after a long, cold endurance challenges. The next day was another recovery day. Avery and I did small segments of the South Rim Trail that we had missed and scouted the South Kaibab, which also descends to the Colorado River. The people on the South Rim were very scarce outside of the Bright Angel Trailhead and the Visitor Center. Most of the paved trails along the South Rim were empty. The preferred way to get to the trailhead was by bus, but of course the buses were not running 
due to the pandemic precaution. On June 10, 2021, I hiked the South Kaibab Trail from the trailhead on the South Rim to the boat beach on the Colorado River. The round trip distance was 17.2 miles according to my GPS watch, but only 13.6 miles officially. The distance discrepancy was 1.5 miles one way to Ua Point by GPS was versus 0.9 miles official distance for Cedar Ridge. The distance was 2.2 miles by GPS and 1.5 miles officially. Skeleton Point was 3.0 miles officially and 4.14 on the GPS. Tonto Tip of Junction was 4.5 miles officially and 5.73 miles on GPS. Finally, Boat Beach was 6.8 miles official and 8.2 on my GPS. I packed out four liters of water. I filled two liters at Boat Beach and drank all six liters on the round trip. There were no clouds and little shade. During the heat of the day, I rested in the shade even when my heart rate was low. The views were magnificent and I was in no danger of finishing after dark. Thus, there was no rush. The only annoyance was young hikers stopping to ask if I was all right when I stopped. In fact, I was fresher and stronger for this hike than I was for the previous two long hikes in the Grand Canyon. When I got back to the travel trailer, the gray water packed up in the shower. It was time to dump both the black and gray tanks. Chapter 8. Going into the Valley of the Shadow of Death. I returned to my Harvest Hose tour after leaving the south rim of the Grand Canyon. Avery and I stayed at in an industrial district of Kingman, Arizona at the Desert Diamond Distillery. This was my first spirits tour since Jan and I visited the Oban factory close to two decades earlier in Oban, Scotland. The husband and wife lived on site in the industrial park by the airport and had been operating the micro distillery for 12 years. The next day, Avery and I went to the Hoover Dam, which was closed to all visitors. Lake Mead was open, but how could it compare to the South Pacific anchorages that I had sailed in prior summers? We drove to Las Vegas, Nevada. I found no place to boondock in Las the Las Vegas Strip, which was partially if not fully closed for the pandemic the boondock on the free roam app was closed instead we drove out to the desert about 60 miles northwest of las vegas where there was some blm land to boondock on i was debating whether to drive to california or visit death valley i entered the lottery to climb half dome in yosemite national park but did not know if i would win after i lost my first lottery death valley seemed the more interesting choice since i had the time i had my license plate shipped to levining california on the east side of yosemite national park my temporary tags expired after a month death valley national park had stunning salt flat sand dunes and multicolored flats as i drove to the lowest elevation on land in the world. All the electrical campsites were closed. Avery had to be carried for all the short hikes because of the heat. The shade temperature at 2 p.m. on June 14, 2020 was 98 degrees Fahrenheit. The gift shop cashier recommended that camping at higher elevations outside the park would be much more pleasant. I boondocked in Beatty, Nevada at a site with a good cellular signal and a lot of flies. The next day, Avery and I visited the ghost town of Rhyolite. In 1907, during the gold rush, Rhyolite had 5,000 to 8,000 people. By 1920, the population was 14. While in Rhyolite, a Nye County, Nevada deputy asked me if I was the camper who called 911. I told him I was not. Avery and I crossed in and out of Nevada and California on our back roads 130 mile drive to Levine in California. We were mostly in the valley, but the mountains ahead were capped with snow. I thought the first boondocking spot on June Lake was not actually legal with signs all over referring to Los Angeles County water. I hiked all around this area for a long time before abandoning it. I tried another stop but decided it was not advisable and got a space at Mono RV Park. It was full hookups with laundry in town for $36 per night. Avery did not like the crowded RV parks and barked like crazy. While in town, I talked to an outfitter who said that the east entrance to Yosemite was closed as it is for most of the year. He said that that entrance 
to the Tioga Pass would open on Monday. That was the same day that my license plate was due at the Lee Vining Post Office. I had booked a seven-day pass beginning on June 18th for Yosemite Park, not for the Half Dome Cables Climb. That was four days away. I wanted to find a boondocking spot before my temporary spot at Mono RV Park ran out on Monday. I found a boondocking spot 120 feet off of Mono Lake. It was just east of the volcano crater. Avery and I hiked the rim that next day. Half Dome. June 16, 2020 was a good day. My license plate for the Jeep came to the post office, and I won the lottery for the Half Dome cables on June 17, 2020. On June 16, I drove over the Tioga Pass. Trucks with larger travel trailers than mine struggled to ascend faster than 10 miles per hour. There were dust storms blowing off the sides of the road. Based on my Half Dome lottery win, which superseded my seven-day pass, I was granted early access to Yosemite, but my last day would be June 22nd. I had booked a Passport America RV full hookup spot in Greeley Hill, California, which was well west of Yosemite. It was the closest electric spot that I could find to the National Park. I was convinced that Avery needed a climate-controlled trailer for our long hikes, I ended up staying there for eight nights at the Passport America rate of $30 per day. Unfortunately, the commute to Yosemite was an excruciating one hour and 15 minutes each way of bare knuckle driving through tight mountain roads. The next day was my lottery day on the Half Dome Cables. Half Dome is a striking rounded mountain presiding over Yosemite Valley at an elevation of 8,846 feet. There were two routes that you could take from Happy Isle, the Happy Isles bus stop. The bus stop was closed. The official round trip distance was 14.2 miles. I took the shortest mist route, which passed by the Vernal and Nevada Falls. The longer but drier route is via the Jean Muir Trail, which had an official round trip distance of 16.5 miles from Happy Isles. In the Upper Pines, I had to backtrack half a mile when I set down my trekking pole and did not pick it up. I found it, but I added to the distance and time. I started walking just before dawn and got to Subdome early. At Subdome, at the Subdome steps, a ranger gave us a safety check and checked to see that we were on the lottery list. 300 permits were issued for the cables each day. The cables are steel cables that allow you to safely ascend the last few hundred yards of the dome. If you cannot use the cables, then half dome, the Half Dome Summit is impossible for all but the most technically advanced climbers. In 2019, you had a 10% chance of winning the cables lottery on the weekend and a 20% chance of winning it on the weekday. There was at least one young couple that snuck around the steps and eventually summited on the cables. I climbed the subdome, the rounded mountain top underneath the half dome on the stairs until the stairs disappeared with no other directions given. There I was for 20 minutes until some people passed me and showed me the route to the top. I did not want to be stumbling over a cliff. At the top of the subdome, the cables up the half dome looked vertical. They were more like a ladder than a staircase that I envisioned. I swore climbing the clay cables was insane and I texted Janet to tell her that I would not go up them. I believe that you should turn around when you find the risk too great. Turning around at the foot of the cables was the right thing to do. Nobody except the hiker really cares if you completed a peak or not. There's no glory or adulation in bagging a peak except in the mind of the hiker climber. You only have to one life to live. The the acclaimed 8,000 meter mountain climber Ed Beasters frequently wrote, going up the mountain is optional, but going down is mandatory. I had a snack and took video of other people climbing and descending the cables. When I got closer to the cables, the trek up and down them seemed more doable. I put on my gloves and as directed, I left my trekking pole at the bottom of the cables. With the pandemic and the littering aspect of leaving one's gloves, the tradition of leaving gloves and ascending and descending the cables that can tear up ungloved hands was over when I climbed. There were no spare gloves waiting for the unprepared. Nevertheless, I bet a descending climber would be happy to gift a pair of 
cheap work or gardening gloves to the ill-prepared. We could not leave our packs at the bottom and were required to wear them to the top. The chipmunks and squirrels in Yellowstone were very aggressive and feeding the aggressive disease-carrying rodents was discouraged with many signs over all the park. A chipmunk would likely chew through your pack if it was unattended for a minute. I climbed the cables quickly and only looked at the next handhold or foothold. I never looked around to see my exposure. My heart rate pounded at 120 beats per minute as I passed many people ascending. I moved fast to make the ordeal shorter. I was atop Half Dome at 1 p.m. on a sunny 65 degree day. I spent half an hour taking pictures and making sure that I did not visit a false peak. Was the true peak over the sheer face of the dome or was it far behind the face? I covered all the bait. I descended with less trouble than ascending, but there were spots where the granite was worn slick even when it was 100% dry. Never attempt half domes cables if there's any moisture on the rock. The added difficulty of the cables is that you must pass people going in your direction or going in the other direction. Thus, the cables are not a solitary exercise. They are a traffic negotiation. The hike through the Little Yosemite Valley is a pleasant shaded hike through the woods. I returned via the mist route and arrived at Vernal, the Vernal Falls restrooms after 4 p.m. Since I arrived after 4 p.m., I did not violate the one-way COVID-19 rule that you could not ascend the steps that were below me. If I was at those steps earlier, the pandemic rules required that I hike the Muir Trail on the way down if the hour was between 8 and 4 p.m. My GPS watch said my round trip from the car was 20 miles, not the 14.2 official distance. Perhaps I should have taken the Muir Trail because my upper thighs were getting stiff from the descent of the stairs. The soreness would persist in the days following. I arrived at the RV after the 1.25 hour drive just before dark. Avery held his pee and poop all day. Avery was alone in the tiny RV from 4 a.m. to 8 p.m. Chapter 10, Climbing El Capitan Without Rope. My next big goal was to climb El Capitan via the Upper Falls route, not along its sheer face. El Capitan is the gold standard of rock climbing. Its sheer vertical face is the challenge that many rock climbers dream of and few at can actually climb. I'm not a rock climber. I just put one foot in front of the other. The Upper Falls route ignores the granite face and climbs the mountain the back way. One of my sailboat crew members who sailed from Ecuador to Hiva Oa Marquesas with me had done that. The passage was over 3,000 nautical miles, and we got hit by a whale in the middle of it. That story is told uh, in a video on my YouTube channel, Slow Boat Sailing. When interviewing for the crew position, he said he started late in the day and they were stumbling around in the dark on the way back. Unfortunately, my legs were too sore to contemplate that long hike up El Capitan. For the next couple days, Avery and I visited Yosemite. We attempted to hike the Bridal Veil Falls, but that path was closed. We visited Mirror Lake, which had very little water. Mirror Lake is a creek and it only reflects the peaks for a limited number of days per year. I took off my shoes and carried Avery to cross its 15-foot wide, quote, lake. While exploring near the village with Avery, I learned one key piece of information. The upper Yosemite Falls and the lower Yosemite Falls had different trailheads. That would be awful if you started hiking the lower Yosemite Falls to find they did not lead to the upper falls or El Capitan. The next day on June 20th, 20. 20, I was still too sore for the El Capitan hike. Instead, I did the smaller hikes of Taft Point, Sentinel Dome, and Glacier Point. They were accessed by a steep road with parking near the, all the hikes. Sentinel Dome was my favorite at 2.2 miles round trip. It was an easier and shorter subdome hike. It I saw bears on my way to Taft Point. I had tried to acquire bear spray in Lee Vining, California, but the outfitters were out of the spray that stuns bears from up to 30 feet. Luckily, there these bears were not interested in me, and I hiked without incident. I drove to Mariposa Grove since the Glacier Point Road was near that side of the vast Yellowstone National Park. Once again, the bus connections to Mariposa Grove were shut down, thus 
the non from the non handicapped parking lot. It was a three mile hike each way to the grizzly giant tree, which impressed Teddy Roosevelt and John Muir when they visited the grove on June twentieth. I hiked 12 miles and drove almost five hours on very dangerous mountain roads. Personally, I would skip the Mariposa Grove and stay for an extra night near the Sequoia Kings Canyon National Park, which has bigger sequoia trees than Mariposa Grove in Yellowstone. I got one more true rest day before El Capitan on June 21st. Avery and I drove around Yosemite Valley but did no substantial hikes. On June 22nd, 2020, I attempted my ascent of El Capitan solo without ropes. I got up early and started hiking before 6 a.m. Unfortunately, I remembered that I forgot my trekking pole in the Jeep point at 0.2 miles. That pushed my hike to a start time of 6.10 a.m. from the parking lot. I departed the RVA park at 4.30 a.m. The Upper Falls stairs were the first part of the El Capitan hike. I cannot emphasize how tough those stairs are. I was hounded by mosquitoes buzzing my face, but mostly not biting for 12 of the 13 hours of the round trip hike. The mosquitoes rarely bit and focus on my eyes. My mosquito repellent seemed to have little effect. I was duped by the 0.2 mile scenic detour that took me a mile round trip after reaching the top of the falls. The Upper Yosemite Falls is the highest waterfall in North America. After the Upper Falls stairs, the trail was mostly wooded, but the trail was easier to lose than other trails in Yosemite because uncut trees interrupted the trail or the trail crossed through unworn granite. It was up an up and down trail, but the ups and downs were not as bad as the upper falls. In the wooded portion, I saw some deer and bear scat. I, as I did during the half dome climb, I accidentally left my trekking pole on a log and had to backtrack adding 0.5 miles to the hike. I treated some water from the closest stream to El Capitan, but in the end, I never drank the iodine treated stream water. I carried four liters of water as with half the half dome climb. This day was hotter than the half dome hike five days earlier by about 15 degrees. No one showed up at the summit of El Capitan when I visited. Moreover, the view atop El Capitan was much better than advertised. The peak of Eagle Point appeared to have a worse view than El Capitan. I ignored the Eagle Point detour on the way back down. Based on the people that I passed, at least four people summited El Capitan that day by the Upper Falls route. Compare that to the 300 permits per day for the half dome cables. El Capitan is the rarer peak to bag. The walk back down the steps of the Upper Falls seemed easier than up. It was shaded almost all the way down, but the mosquitoes never left me. I was it was slow going and I reached the Jeep after 7 p.m. This time, when I found Avery, he had peed on the floor diaper, but there was no other mess. The air conditioner did its job and kept Avery cool all day. Instead of going back to Yosemite for the last day of my permit, I left Avery in the trailer at the RV park and got the oil changed at the nearest dealership the following day. The commute to Yosemite Valley had become too much, and I was ready to move on after six days. Chapter 11, Returning to Las Vegas. Our mission was to get to Las Vegas and find a campsite prior to Jan and Sophie's arrival there by plane in a few days. Avery and I broke camp and drove to Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Park. Unfortunately, the potential boondock near the park entrance proved far-fetched. Every piece of buildable land near the park was exploited, and all that I would that would have been too hilly to camp on anyways. At the entrance to the park, they warned that the road to the Great Trees was only for vehicles without trailers, which were less than 22 feet long due to the hairpin turns of the mountain. The giant sequoias, such as the biggest of them, General Sherman, were about 7,000 feet above sea level, while the park entrance was um, nearly 2,000 feet of elevation. I had little choice but to backtrack and pay $59 before tax for the full hookup spot in the town of Lemon, California. I dropped the trailer and left Avery there. The climb in the Jeep was steep, but worth it as the sequoias left me gaping. I parked at the side of the road next to the giant sequoia, nearly as big as the grizzly giant in Mariposa Grove in Yosemite. But this tree in Sequoia and Kings Canyon National Park was much healthier. In the non-handicapped parking lot, you need to wait 30 minutes for a shuttle to take you to the great General Sherman tree. Nevertheless, if you parked on the side of the road, 
you could walk back to the handicapped entrance. I did the latter. General Sherman was the biggest living tree by volume when I visited. General Sherman was not the tallest. It was not the widest. It was not the oldest, but it was big. I milked my full-service RV spot to the fullest doing laundry and leaving at the last possible minute. The scenery today was the massive corporate farms exploiting watership from other parts of the West, such as the damming of Cal- the Colorado River to irrigate Calif- the F- California desert. It was an environmental abomination for the purposes of corporate welfare. I passed the sign advertising the Teapot Dome Peak, a name made infamous by scandals in the President Harding administration a century earlier. Avery and I boondocked at an off-road vehicle playground on the Bureau of Land Management BLM property outside of Barstow, California. It was well-marked and could have accommodated hundreds of campers. Only a conversion van joined me in taking a spot. My next day's boondock was to be another off-road vehicle playground on the federal government land north of Las Vegas. Unfortunately, this potential overnight spot was very much used by commercial operators and no camping signs were everywhere. I looked along I-15 at the BLM land to the north for a good spot to camp. I turned into a tight camping spot marred by broken glass, which I picked up and discarded at the next gas station trash can. I ran the generator all night. When it kicked off at 1 a.m., the cabin temperature was still in the high 80s, so much for the theory that it gets cold in the desert at night. I put more gas in it and ran it until morning. Avery and I got ready for the visit of our favorite people. I did laundry and got groceries and Avery got groomed. I vacuumed the huge quantity of sand and dirt out of my formerly new Jeep. Chapter 12, Zion. Jana and Sophie arrived at the Las Vegas airport around 5 p.m. The boondock at the apex exit 58 on Interstate 15 was both blowing a gale and hot. We departed for our RV park in Virgin, Utah, near Zion National Park the next morning. It was a scenic drive through the mountains. We were issued a back in space, which really did not give us enough room to back in straight. Jana asked to back in. The RV park staff pestered her with stupid directions and how can I help offers. I asked them to give us a space where backing up was easier, such as 103 or 104 right next to us. Giving us an easier space was not help the RV park staff could give. Our spot 102 required a sharp turn. At one point, Jenna did back into the space, but the idiotic RV park worker had her drive out, and she never came close again. Eventually, Jenna let me try, and I asked the parking light lot drivers to go away. I eventually got in, but because the space was 28 feet long, the Jeep had to be parked sideways. After dropping the trailer, we visited Zion. The scenic drive on the bottom of the canyon supposedly filled up by 7 a.m. The scenic drive opens at 6 a.m., but the line for the scenic drive began at 2 a.m. Towards the end of the day, it was possible to get in the scenic drive, but you had to leave by dark, which was about 8.45 p.m. at that point in the year. We walked the Paras paved trail through the upper campground to the scenic drive to the campground. It was too late after 6 p.m. to attempt the upper and middle Emerald Pools hike, but we did get to go up and down the scenic drive and turned around as traffic began to build up at the last stop of the temple. With our first full day in Zion, we did not get up early enough to snag a space in the scenic drive. We drove at the Canyon Overlook Trail by the old tunnel, We were not the only ones to have this idea and had to navigate through the less-than-fit hikers of all ages. Jana signed up for the shuttle pass for the next day, July 1st, starting at 9 a.m. Starting in July, the park was close to all cars past the visitor center. Thus, the bus was the only option. We planned to do the Narrows hike up the Virgin River. We rented boots, neoprene socks, walking sticks, backpacks, and dry bags. The river was supposed to be 60 degrees, despite the 90-plus degrees outside temperature, and the Narrows Walk is 9 miles and should not be attempted in rain due to flash flooding risk. On July 1st, 2020, we took the 10 a.m. shuttle to 
the Temple of Sinawava, the last stop on the scenic drive in the canyon. This is the first time I took public transit since the COVID-19 lockdowns on the trip. All National Park shuttles were closed prior to this. As a nod to the pandemic, the bus was at half capacity. We were told to keep the windows open and we had to wear masks. Everyone seemed to be going to the last stop. The first mile or so was just walking beside the river. Then we started walking in the Virgin River. At the deepest point that we forded, it probably was over two feet. The walking stick made it much easier. I kept expecting the train of hikers to thin out, but it got worse and worse. Hikers from every age, zero to 80, attempted the dangerous and strenuous hike. I asked Janet to dress Sophie in only non-cotton clothing, but I think she lacked the wardrobe for that. When Sophie slipped on a rock and got wet, her teeth began chattering. Cotton just dries very poorly. Sophie put on a dry cotton shirt that Jana packed, and we turned around about 2.5 miles into the hike. We got back to our car in time to drop off the rental supplies before the outfitter closed and had lunch in Springdale, Utah. We had more shuttle tickets on July 2nd because Jana booked them the prior day at 9 a.m. We took the shuttle to the Emerald Pools. As before, you could book bus passes for the next day at 9 a.m. local time. Uh, we had to park just outside the park for $20 per day because the visitor center lot was full. We got off the shuttle stop for the grotto, the closest stop to the intermediate and upper emerald pools. The pools themselves were pretty small. They were mossy pools of water along the canyon walls. It was an enjoyable elevation hike of about three miles. We hiked a half mile from the grotto to the lodge where we got takeout lunch. We took the shuttle back to the visitor center and walked back to our Jeep just outside the park gate. Jana originally booked several days in the Needles Campground at Canyonland National Park. That was a very long drive from Zion. In addition, there were no electrical hookups, although generators were allowed prior to 10 p.m. Since the temperatures were 100 degrees Fahrenheit, that would not work with Avery because dogs were not allowed on most of the trails and it was risky to run a generator while we were gone. We booked a private RV park near Moab, Utah, and the Arches and Canyonlands National Parks. We spent most of the day traveling there on July 3rd. Chapter 13, Moab and Bryce Canyon. We visited the islands in the sky section of the Canyonlands National Park. We passed the closer arches because we thought it would be packed for the holiday. Canyonlands is just a much less popular park than Arches. We rented audio guides and really enjoyed them. The guides had descriptions all along the stops of the giant mesa. Canyonlands has three districts, which are not connected. Islands in the Sky is the easiest to get to. Needles and the River District are harder to get to. We drove the entire length of the Islands in the Sky. We stuck to the paved roads. We also hiked the Easy White Rim Overlook, Upheaval Dome, and Grandview Trails. Our favorite was the Upheaval Dome and its green crater, which was either caused by a meteor impact or a salt dome collapse. I was interested in hiking the Gooseberry Trail to the valley floor, 1,400 feet below, but Jan and Sophie were not up for that. It was very hot, and there was almost no shade. Canyon Lions Islands in the Sky is like looking out from the Grand Canyon, except there is no opposite rim to peer at. The canyons just stretched out for miles in the horizon. Back at our RV park, we saw fireworks going off at 10 p.m. Sophie said it was the first time she had saw fireworks go off since she was four. On July 4th, 2020, Sophie was nine years old. Jan and Sophie had been visiting me on the boat in some foreign country over the 4th of July. Her prior 4th of July holidays were spent in New Caledonia, Tonga, Tahiti, and Panama. Arches National Park was spectacular. Its rock formations that formed arches of merely or merely windows were the ancient work of erosion in the Red Desert. We did the hikes of north and south windows, turret arch, double arch, skyway arch, and many more. Some were big enough to climb along the bottom. Sophie was invited by the RV neighbor to play with their nine-year-old daughter. After we left, Jana pointed out that their, the nine-year-old's father walked around with handcuffs and a gun on his belt. We were not nearly so security conscious. 
On July 6th, we left Moab for Bryce Canyon, where we had three nights at an RV park in Tropic, Utah. While we did not visit Bryce Canyon National Park that first day, we did get to see the towers of tan and red stripe hoodoo rock formations as we descended the valley where Tropic is located. We took a long and rural route from Moab to Bryce Canyon. At one point, we rambled along a gravel road before we found pavement again on Utah Highway 12. On July 7th, we arrived at the park and attempted the Queen's Garden hike. Unfortunately, we did not take Sophie's Junior Ranger book. Each hike completed had a rub-off for the Junior Ranger Award. We saw all the Queen's Garden and the Wall Street section of the Navajo Loop by starting at Sunrise Point and returning to the rim at Sunset Point. Then we backtracked to our car at Sunrise Point for a total of four miles. Queen's Garden was my favorite trail in the park. You hike among hoodoo spires and see the clay and sand structures from every angle, including tunneling through the Towers of Decay. Wall Street was one of the most spectacular part of the Navajo Loop. It was a narrow slot canyon that finished with the short switchbacks that lift hikers hundreds of feet to the rim. Most of the rest of the day, we drove the length of the scenic drive at dozens of rim vistas. Bryce Canyon is not really a canyon. It's a series of amphitheaters of hoodoos. The next day, we had a few stops on the scenic drive we had not seen. With the little cellular signal that I had, I asked the Jeep dealer to send my permanent tag ahead to the FedEx facility in Overton, Nevada, near Las Vegas. I was driving on expired temporary tags. Uh, We hiked the two-mile Peekaboo Loop Trail. There were many chunks of clay that crumbled off the walls of this trail. This underscored how fragile all of Bryce Canyon was. A ton of clay could come down on you at any moment. Chapter 14, Burned by the Grand Canyon. We departed Tropic, Utah on July 9th, 2020 with the teardrop trailer in tow and headed 150 miles south to the north rim of the Grand Canyon. We camped at BLM Road 213 in northern Arizona after driving through many miles of burned forests. Our campsite was nicely wooded with a fire pit, but we were serenaded by howling wolves that night. There were other RV campers at other large sites at this boondock at about 8,000 feet above sea level. Jana's family had visited the North Rim in the 1980s, going on mule rides into the canyon and taking a helicopter ride above. My objective was much simpler. I just wanted to see the rim of it. The North Rim of the Grand Canyon is so different from the South Rim. I prefer the South Rim by far. Perhaps I was a pickier consumer of national parks, beauty, after visiting the South Rim, Yosemite, Zion, Canyonlands, Arches, and Bryce Canyon. The park entrance was four miles from the boondock. We saw a herd of three dozen bison relaxing on the alpine plain on the way. Unlike the South Rim, which has dozens of miles of trails along the rim, the North Rim only has a point. There are a few points where you can look at the Grand Canyon in the North Rim National Park. Moreover, the closest point to the visitor center was closed to dogs. Thus, I had to carry Avery in his bag to Bright Angel Point. This was the terminus of the trail that I that I had hiked from the South Rim to Col- the Colorado River. It is a much longer hike from the South Rim to the North Rim. Bright Angel Point was a scary trail despite its short length with its steep drop-offs for the clumsy. I did not think the view from the North Rim was as good as the view from the South Rim. The higher elevation of the North Rim made it harder to see the rock layers. The North Rim had more vegetation also obscuring the different rock strata. The visitor center was on the narrow peninsula versus the long rim of the South Rim. Before we drove off, we hiked the parts of the bridle path and the nature and transept trails with Avery out of the bag. Our views were mostly of pines and these were probably the least interesting trails we had hiked since Jana and Sophie arrived. We drove to the point Imperial which looked onto the green plains and hills north of the Grand Canyon. Point Imperial was the highest point in the Grand Canyon at 8,800 feet above sea level. While I like that view, the seldom used paved road to it was too scary. I had no stomach for the 30-mile round trip further on that road to Cape Royal. 
The North Rim was closed to the forest fires a couple of weeks before we arrived. This weighed heavily on Jana's mind on our second night at the boondock. Without a cellular signal, we played the card game Go Fish to pass the time. We departed the boondock near the North Rim of the Grand Canyon at 8 a.m. and drove to Overton, Nevada, where I illegally parked on a busy street to pick up the license plate at the FedEx sort facility. The parking lot at the FedEx reception was too small to turn the trailer around in. FedEx gave me all kinds of grief about shipping it to the distribution center, but it was there. I put it on the plate after we arrived at the La Quinta Inn. It was so hot that the La Quinta Inn air conditioning was not working in one of our adjoining rooms, and we had to prop open a door to make the temperature bearable in the other. Avery and I dropped off Jana and Sophie at the airport, and Avery howled with grief after we left them. Chapter 15 the Valley of Fire Bees and Rams. Avery and I drove to the Valley of Fire State Park. I did not know if any RV sites would be available, but I found many electric and water sites for $30 per night. I dropped the trailer and turned on the air conditioning with the initial temperature of 115 degrees Fahrenheit at 1 p.m. Avery and I toured all the close to the road sites, which were within a quarter of a mile of their pullover. I found the thought of hiking a mile in that heat unthinkable, even without Avery, and with large supplies of water. My guess was that two liters of water per hour would be necessary. We drove to the nearest town of Overton, Nevada for ice and ice cream. The hacking COVID-19 like cough of a guest at the visitor center turned me off the ice cream there. Of course, the hacking cough lady only wore her mask over her mouth, but not over her nose. When Avery and I got back to the trailer, it was 120 degrees inside, despite the electric running. The air conditioner was cutting off after a two-minute interval. We got an error of E07 on the Elwell Air 8 unit. The manual of the said the E07 stands for High Pressure Sensor Trigger. As it was a Saturday, there was little chance of getting a hold of the small air conditioning manufacturer or my RV maker, New Camp. To my surprise, Elwell did get back to me by email that night. Josh Elwell wrote, almost any E07 I have dealt with so far is because the air conditioner is not sitting correctly on its vent holes and circulating air. I saw no evidence of that. The air conditioner's position had not moved and we were on a very level spot. Instead, the new camp forum said that the air conditioner cannot take huge temperature differentials from the desired temperature versus the air temperature. The highest temperature setting for the air conditioner is 86 degrees Fahrenheit. I prepared the back seat of the Jeep to sleep. We tried hanging out in the shade of the Jeep, but Avery was panting heavily and the bees were swarming us. We for we were forced to retreat into the Jeep's air conditioning. A sign near the shower suggested putting out a bowl of water far from your camp to attract the bees. That worked for a time, but I still ended up killing two bees that could not be shooed away. One was in the Jeep and the other was in the shower. As a rule, I never kill stinging insects and bees especially, but those two bees were too aggressive and dangerous. Eventually after sunset, the trailer air conditioning maximum temperature was not far from the actual air temperature. That allowed Avery and I to move inside the RV. Nevertheless, I was awakened at 3 a.m. by the trailer rocking. I looked outside the driver's side window, but I could not see anything. Then I heard a horn hit the side of the trailer. I went outside to find a big horn sheep drinking from the condensation of the air conditioner, which had pooled on the driver's side of the Tab 320S trailer. After that, I decided to start breaking up camp. Nevertheless, I wanted to get my money's worth from the $8 a day Wi-Fi at the camp, but it was not really working. The situation outside started spiraling out of control while I fooled with the internet. Now, not dozens, but hundreds of bees were swarming the air conditioning water discharge. After renting the trailer for departure as much as I could without disturbing the swarm of bees, I turned off the air conditioner and drove to Overton, Nevada for ice cream and coffee in the hopes that the bees would leave after the water spigot had turned off. While in Overton, I booked two nights in Escalante, Utah so that Avery could have air conditioning while I hiked the Spooky Gulch and Peekaboo Canyon. That was about 273 miles away. I dodged dozens of bees while 
raising stabilizers, removing water and electrical hookups, and hitching the trailer, I never got stung miraculously. When I retrieved my water bowl, I threw out two dozen dead bees. The bees loved the water, but were awful swimmers. Chapter 16, Lost in Grand Escalante. After that mostly sleepless night, the 273-mile drive to the RV park required a lot of caffeine. Avery and I did not get a particularly early departure because of the bees. Moreover, the scenery was a repeat of the drive with Jana and Sophie. Avery and I retraced our track into the Virgin River Gorge, past Zion National Park, past Bryce Canyon, through Tropic Utah, and then eventually into Escalante, Utah. I despaired that I did not advocate more strongly for outbound flights from Salt Lake City. If gas prices were $2.50 per gallon and the Jeep averaged 15 miles per gallon, each mile would have cost about 17 cents. I think Jan and Sophie saved more than $91 in airfares flying out of Las Vegas. Nevertheless, if I dropped the trailer at the boondock in Utah and drove Jana and Sophie back to Las Vegas, that may have made more sense than what I ended up doing. I left Avery at the RV park and drove three miles outside of t the town of Escalante, where I turned down a dirt gravel road of BLM 200, which I would drive down for 26 miles to the trailhead parking lot. Then I was supposed there, it was supposedly a six mile hike to the Tamer Peekaboo Canyon. After completing Peekaboo, most people exited back their original trail via Spooky Canyon, but you could also return by walking around the canyon. Before leaving town at 8.30 a.m., I visited the BLM office where someone came out to explain the hike. The BLM Visitor Center employee explained that there were two ways to descend into Spooky Canyon. She thought it was easier to use the smaller entrance. She explained the pros and cons of the upper and lower parking lots. The upper parking lot went through another slot canyon, the Narrows, since both lots seemed equidistant, the narrow seemed and the narrow seemed interesting, I opted for that one. She said that the slot canyons were totally dry on this day due to lack of rainfall. This convinced me to ditch my water shoes. I heard folks got scratched up in the canyons as they squeezed through the tight spaces. For this reason, I wore a long sleeve shirt and pants. At the upper lot trailhead, I found the trail marked by pink ribbons, and it initially was clear the sand that had been trampled. When I ventured onto the rock, the clues were cairns, which led me to the narrows. Thanks to the description from the ranger at the visitor center, I was sure I wanted to follow the deeper canyon. When I emerged from the narrows, I did not see any close by marker. Nevertheless, wandering around the open area, I spotted the two inch by five inch brown painted trail marker. Next to it was a sign pointing to Peekaboo Canyon 100 yards ahead. Peekaboo required a sandstone climb about 15 feet up. There are handholds and footholds worn into the rock so that most folks can free climb it. There was a huge group of folks aged 2 to 60 with body mass indexes, BMIs, between 17.5 and 35, trying to decide if they would climb up. Thankfully, they let me jump in front, and I did not have to wait for crying two-year-old children. This was not a model of pandemic social distancing. I donned my mask and plunged forward. The first part of the peekaboo was very narrow for one quarter of the mile, then it widened out for a half mile before narrowing again and more wriggling between the rocks was required. When I merged in the full sun, it took some patience to find the, the trail to Spooky Gulch. I had planned to skip the harder Spooky Gulch, but with the huge group behind me, it re Tracing my steps into Peekaboo Canyon seemed impossible. At the start of Spooky Canyon, there were, was a 20-something woman crying. She was balking at the 15-foot drop at the start that the ranger warned about. Her friend and the man with the three sons who had passed me in the Narrows were urging her to descend. There were three ways I could see to get down. The first one that made the woman cry in fear had you descend seven feet on a steep slope and then jump or chimney climb the rest. A chimney climb has you put pressure on two parallel walls. It is a very secure, no gear and no skill required method of climbing or down climbing vertical walls. You must be able to reach both walls at the same time, but this, thus the walls must be within a few feet of one another, or you can't make 
two or more points of contact at the same time. The other two ways to descend the 15 feet were chimney climbs down the three foot wide walls. I went around the distressed woman and descended the middle entrance, leaving the scene of the drama. Spooky was much cool, a much cooler temperature than peekaboo, but it was not cool enough to have me don my hoodie. There were knobs on the walls where unprotected flesh could be caught. Fortunately, my shirt and pants were sufficient protection. I resisted the urge to chimney climb some of the sections instead descended further. I correctly feared that the gulch would descend further and strand me climbing very high up. I stuck to the ground, but my chest and body got stuck a couple places along the way. It was a struggle for me to find the correct path to the Peekaboo Canyon and the Narrows. I eventually found a sign and emerged from the Narrows. Unfortunately, after a mile, I was lost on a ridge over a wash. I followed the trail of the wash, and I found Cairns leading me to the southwest when I thought the trail should have been leading me northwest. I saw tracks in the dry wash and followed them there where two women were debating descending into Spooky Gulch. I told them that I thought I had the wrong trail and headed west. The wash turned out to be the wrong way and the trail went very cold. Soon I was scrambling over a half a dozen ridges and valleys and navigating west towards where I believe the road BLM 200 was. I spotted cars in the bathroom, which was like the upper lot to the south. I did not aim directly to it because I did not know if it was the upper or lower lot. In the end, it was the upper parking lot. I scaled the wire fence onto the road about a half mile north of the upper lot. My watch said I'd walk nine miles or three more miles than the official round trip distance of the hike. I carried three liters of water but could have used four on the in the heat of the day. I arrived back in the Jeep at 3.15 p.m. on July 13, 2020. An out-of-shape woman who took the correct trail was screaming for water, and two kind men ran out to her with extra water as she approached her car. After a long drive, on the dirt and gravel road, I found Avery was cool in the trailer when I returned about 4.30. Chapter 17, Trip Paused and the Final Mission. Avery and I did a small hike at the Petrified Forest State Park of Utah the next day. It was a $8 fee, and we did a 1.2-mile loop in which Avery was carried for half a mile. Of course, this was very similar to the petrified wood I saw in Arizona at the start of my RV trip. Unfortunately, there were no more hikes in Grand Staircase Escalante that appealed to me. I was at a loss for further national parks or monuments that I wanted to visit. Yellowstone was too far in the wrong direction from home. I felt pretty satisfied with my trip so far and was ready to go back to Lafayette, Louisiana. There was just one thing I really wanted to do. I wanted to climb a Colorado 14er. A 14er is one of the dozens of 14 thousand foot plus tall mountains in the lower 48 United States. No mountains in the lower 48 United States are over 15,000 feet tall. Only three states have 14ers. California has about a dozen. Washington has two if you define Liberty Cap on Mount Rainier as a different mountain than Rainier's primary peak. Colorado has over four dozen. I identified the four or five of the easiest, which were just off Interstate 70 west of Denver. They were in no order. Grays Peak, Class 1, round trip 8 miles, approximate elevation gain 3,000 feet, elevation 14,270. Torrey's Peak, Class 2, round trip 8 miles, approximate elevation gain 3,000 feet, elevation 14,267. It's on the same saddle as Grays Peak, meaning you could bag two easy 14ers. 3. Quandary Peak, Class 1, round trip 7 miles, approximate elevation gain 3,000 feet. Elevation 14,265 feet. Mount Bierstadt, Class 2, round trip 7 miles, approximate elevation gain 3,000 feet. Elevation 14,060 feet. After Escalante, Avery and I camped at a boondock near Capitol Reef National Park. I was racing to find electricity and Wi Fi. I was too far from Lafayette, Louisiana before the midnight launch on June 17, 2020 of a new video game that I wanted to cover named Ghosts of Tsushima. For the last couple of years, I had been experimenting with my Linus Wilson YouTube channel 
with videos on trending topics after one of my research papers I'd identified it trending as a determinant of more views. I was very successful with my coverage of the TV show Game of Thrones, but it ended. My subscribers shot up from a, under 100 to over 400 overnight. Then my views and new subscribers fell off a cliff. I picked up coverage of similar TV shows such as The Witcher, but my efforts were not so successful. I played The Witcher video games to get video for my TV show coverage and found my video game tips videos for the five-year-old Witcher 3 Wild Hunt video game did much better than my TV coverage videos. Thus, I wanted to cover a similar new release because new releases are trending and get the most interest around the launch date. I spent a week around the Ghost of Tsushima launch date at the two Passport America RV parks in Moab, Utah, playing the game and pumping out tips and tricks videos. My coverage of Ghost of Tsushima was very successful, pushing my channel over a thousand subscribers and allowing me to make money on YouTube ads. By July 23rd, 2020, I was able to take a break from my videos about video a video game to arrive at the shadow of Quandary Peak. I left Adrian on July 24, 2020 at a full hookup motel and RV park which had an elevation of about 10,000 feet. I arrived at the trailhead just before dawn and was able to squeeze in a parallel parking space very near the trailhead. The 3.33 mile trek up with a 3,375 elevation gain was a very steep I had far too many clothes on to start. It really got interesting above the tree line at about 13,000 feet. I probably should have booked an extra day at the RV park at altitude to get acclimated. Moab was only about 4,000 feet in elevation. I slowed down and persevered, and my brief fog lifted. I was standing on a large flat summit, 14,265 feet, with several dozen other hikers very soon. I descended without difficulty and was back in the Jeep before noon. Colorado has a lot of lightning activity in the summer afternoon. Thus, finishing in the morning is the safest way to do one of these climbs. In a few days, I was home in Lafayette, Louisiana. The Tab 320S took its place in the garage. I spent more time at home in the fall 2020 than in spring 2020 because the classes that I taught in the fall were fully remote. I had gone on the RV trip of my dreams despite the illegal power grabs of politicians and epidemiologists. Nobody got hurt. We got the experience of the natural gems of America, which are located far from Governor's Man. Appendix 1, backing a small travel trailer. Jana wanted me to give some tips for my backing a small travel trailer. I primarily rely on the backup camera. If the center of the backup line goes through the ball, then the trailer will keep its current angle. If the backup camera center line is off one way or the other, then the angle of the trailer will go one way or the other. It is obvious how to break the trailer one way or the other if you watch what you are doing with little corrections. Unfortunately, you are limited by how far you can break before jackknifing and having to straighten out. The more space you have to straighten out, the better. When backing up slopes like my driveway, I like to use four-wheel drive low. I also try to avoid situations where backing is necessary. Thus, thinking ahead can save the travel trailer hauler some grief. If you do not have a backup camera, they are going for as little as $99. Nevertheless, using the side mirrors can be done to track if the trailer is going straight or braking. I find looking at the front wheels of the tow vehicle is also helpful to predict the reaction of the travel trailer to a movement of the wheel. Appendix 2, Sophie's alternative titles for this book. Here are some alternative titles that my daughter Sophie suggested for this book. Many are no doubt better than the current title. You may wish to call this book by these alternative titles. Why being RVful makes me gleeful. Cush Pringling and other new words to use while camping. Cruising with the camper. Travels with the trailer. Ride with the RV. Me and my land boat, crying, camping, teardrops of happiness. How COVID kicked me from Australia into Utah. 
COVID ruined everything. Slow vid, slow boat, sailing, slash camping. Me, my wife, kid, and an annoying dog. The end.